You never find it. Thanks for listening to the Doonstief Audio Fiction Magazine. And now here's your host, Rish Outfield. Did I mention you'll never find it? And Big Anklevich. Did you fart? Maybe. Hi, everybody. Welcome to another episode, another half of a story that we started earlier here on the Doonstief Audio Fiction Magazine. I'm Big Anklevich. And this is Rich Outfield. Uh, okay, so uh, yeah, uh, we've got second half of Like a Good Neighbor. Second half. Yes. Do not listen to this episode. That, that's all. Just do not listen to it. <laughs> but if you want to find out what happens next, you're probably going to have to. We're going to just jump right into the story. You've probably heard of the author Rich Outfield, so we're not going to really give you a lot of background on him. Other than that, he's a douche. Um, and yeah, that's it. Enjoy the story and we'll be back after, uh, after it rolls. Okay. There you go. Like a Good Neighbor by Rish Outfield. It was 1130 when Lara's alarm clock woke her. She hadn't expected to need it but kept yawning, so she set the alarm just in case. It had been a smart move, too, because when the alarm began beeping, Lara momentarily forgot what it had been set for, and indeed, that it wasn't time to get up for school. She shook her head to clear it, then leaned over and turned the alarm clock off. She then got out of bed and changed into pants and a t-shirt. She still had her socks on, so she slipped on her shoes, tied them, and flipped off her light just as she opened her door. All in the house was dark and quiet, and once again she crept downstairs and out the back door. In the backyard, she'd placed a bucket she'd kept her littlest pet shop toys in, and she scooped it up and quickly headed to her neighbor's yard. Old Widow Holcomb stood in her driveway, motionless as a creepy religious statue in a cemetery. Lara's arm hairs rose when she saw her there. Am I late? She asked. You may be, the woman said, her expression sour. Why am I doing this again? Because you want to teach me magic, Lara said, fingering the necklace she wore under her t-shirt. Oh, yes, said the witch. They drove in the old woman's big gray car. It looked like she'd had it for a hundred years, but Lara didn't know if cars had been around a hundred years, let alone that particular model. The passenger seat belt did not work for some reason. Lara tried not to dwell on it. She was aware that this car had held a dead body, or parts of a dead body, less than forty-eight hours before, and couldn't put that thought out of her mind. The witch was absolutely silent, her face unreadable by the orange-red dashboard lights. Mrs. Holcomb? Lara said. Yes? Are you very, very old? Depends on what one compares me to, said the witch. Compared to you, oh yes. Compared to a tree in the forest? Not so terribly old. Lara nodded slowly. Compared to a person, though, like a grandma or a grandpa? I suppose so. Unless it's quite a remarkable grandma or grandpa. The car stopped on Regent Street, and Holcomb shut off the lights and engine. They got out of the car. Except for a dog barking someplace and an insect buzzing in the leaves above them, the night was still. Along the north side of the street, a little woods began, and continued for a half mile or so. Lara had played in them once or twice over the years the family had lived there, and remembered some of the boys in her grade claiming they'd build a clubhouse in there, before they'd lost interest. Not too long ago, the whole town was woodlands like this, said Holcomb, getting a sandwich bag out of the back seat of the car. All of it was owned by the Foydler family, 
and block by block it was cut down and developed, until only a sad fraction remains. Lara sighed. Like the rainforest. The old woman glanced over at her, but it was too dark to gauge her expression. Yes, I suppose. Have you ever been to the rainforest? Lara asked. No. They say there's a lot of magic there. I don't know why I've never had the notion to go. They walked through the empty lot at the edge of the woods, and Lara turned on her flashlight. Is there a lot of magic here, too? Not any more. The forests were once vast, magnificent places, full of lost thickets and meadows, each with their own secrets and wonders. But nowadays, people only want those things in between commercial breaks. They entered the woods, their flashlight beams moving from tree trunks to grass to the rocky path before them. What kind of toadstools are we looking for? Special ones, said the witch. She stopped. Come over here beside me. I have an idea. Lara did so, hearing crickets and night birds all around them, but not able to see anything. What is... The old woman began to chant. It was in a language Lara had never heard, and it didn't sound like the spell she had cast earlier that day. Thukbo militades kathalek, intoned the witch. She touched Lara's arm. Hold your breath during this part, she said, then continued to chant. Thukbo militades Suddenly, all around them, the forest changed. It was still dark, but here and there was cool blue light of glowing objects or trees. The witch stopped chanting, and Lara released her captured breath. Wow, she whispered. This will help us in our search, Holcomb said. Anything bearing magical properties will give off a glow, helping us find which mushrooms are... She stopped talking, looking at the little girl. Lara glanced down. The front of her shirt was glowing light blue, as if she'd stuck a Halloween glow stick down there. Whoops. That's my pendant, isn't it? The witch asked. She sounded neither angry nor surprised. Yes. Lara admitted. But you don't mind. The witch harumphed to herself. Hmm. I suppose I don't. Not that I have a choice. A pendant of Espindola is subtle magic, but effective. That one was given to me in 1963. I traded a child for it. You did? Whose child was it? The witch sniffed. My own, of course. Lara didn't know what to think about that. Why? Why what? Why would you do that? I wanted the pendant. I knew I could always have another son. Lara swallowed. Who did you trade it to? She asked, hoping the answer wasn't the devil. To the boy's father, silly. That was our agreement. Lara didn't understand. But within a minute of walking, one of the trees they had just passed glowed like a Christmas tree, its leaves shimmering in a faint breeze. It was almost as bright as the girl's flashlight. That tree is magical? Very, said Holcomb. I've prayed to it before. It has many wishes left in it. Lara opened her mouth to ask more, but the witch began to walk on. Lara gazed at the special tree for just a moment, then moved to catch up. Several yards away, a cluster of mushrooms glowed faintly at the base of a tree that did not glow. Holcomb picked seven mushrooms, placing them in the bag that Lara now held in her bucket, leaving the ones that didn't glow. Don't you miss him? The girl asked. Who? Your child, your son. Sometimes. Not for a long while. 
but listen, Laura. You have surely lost teeth over the years. They were a part of you, but do you mourn them? My baby teeth? Laura asked, confused. Exactly, said the witch, as though the girl had made her point for her. She placed one more mushroom, this one tiny and white, in the sandwich bag. How many do we need? For the spell I'm thinking of, this is plenty. Lara glanced around, suddenly aware of how dark it had gotten. The glowing spots of the forest were fading. Can you teach me how to do that glowing spell? I suppose. You wouldn't know what to do with it, though. What do you mean? If you saw a glowing plant or rock, you'd need a little knowledge to make use of them. I guess, said the girl. Just how many spells are you requiring me to teach you, child? Lara shrugged. She hadn't numbered them, had she? Just one or two more, I guess. And then you'll let me alone? I guess... She said sheepishly. The witch started back toward the car. She must have been able to see better than Lara, because she rarely pointed her flashlight in front of her, simply held it by her side. So what's this spell going to be? Lara asked, following along. Which one? The one the mushrooms are for. Toadstools, girl. They're good for a number of spells, but the simplest one is a hiding spell. Hiding? Something to make you overlooked by your enemies. Or spying on your friends. A trick you already seem adept at. Lara smiled. She didn't know what adept meant, but it sounded like a compliment. And was old widow Holcomb calling her a friend? This was exciting. They drove home and the witch told her to return to her house and get some sleep. But the spell, it'll take me an hour or so to get it all ready. We might as well continue this tomorrow. But, and don't go using the pendant to force me to change my mind. You're a little girl, and you need your rest. That sounded like something her mother or grandmother would say. There's no school tomorrow. It's teacher prep day. Are you lying to me, girl? What's teacher prep day? I don't know, but it's once a year and there's no school. The witch sighed. Well, I believe you, but I would, even if it's untrue. Still, get some shut-eye and we'll learn the spell tomorrow. Lara considered arguing, making the witch want to keep teaching her. But she felt a yawn coming on, and decided to call it a night. The next morning, Lara's mother was taking a letter to the mailbox when the old woman from next door greeted her. Hello there, Ms. Deming. Hello. Lara's mother glanced over at the neighbor and nodded, then did a double take. For a moment, even though it had been old widow Holcomb's voice, there had been a young woman standing at the edge of the yard. Holcomb's daughter? Her granddaughter? But no, it was just the elderly woman, when Mrs. Deming looked closer, holding a broom, having just swept her driveway. Your daughter's at school today? What? No, they have the day off, I'm sorry to say. Oh, well, I wonder if I might trouble you to borrow your youngest for an hour or two. I got a book of recipes, but the darn print is so small, I can't make hide nor hair of them. Lara's mother nodded, a little surprised by the friendliness her normally aloof neighbor was demonstrating. "'My youngest?' she asked. "'Emma would probably do better with something like that. Laura would just get in the way, or worse, break something.' "'Well, Miss Deming, I don't have much that I'd worry about breaking.' "'All right. 
I'll send Laura over after lunch, and please call me Marjorie. Laura pretended to be surprised when her mother told her the neighbor lady needed her help that afternoon, and also faked her reluctance to go over there. She must have been too convincing, because her mother said, Honey, if you don't want to do it, I'll give her some excuse. I just thought it would be nice for you to— No, no, I'll do it, Laura said, remembering the pendant of a spindula she still wore beneath her shirt. She went over to the Holcomb house after lunch and took along a nice red apple. What's this for? The old woman, looking very much like a young woman, asked. I thought it would be funny, Lara said. The girl giving the witch an apple for a change? The old woman laughed, <laughs> then scowled. I wonder how funny that observation would be without my pendant around your neck. Laura stuck her tongue out at her, and followed her into the house. In the kitchen, a pot was bubbling on the stove, an unusual smell wafting from it. Is that the toadstools? That child is goulash. Would you like a bowl? No, thank you. The witch had made a kind of cream out of the mushrooms, which, when applied to the temples, made the wearer less noticeable in a crowd or invisible in a dark room. Or unbeatable in a hiding-and-seeking game, the witch added. There was a hint of a smile at the corner of her unwrinkled lips, and Lara wondered how her tone, and her words, might change if she ever forgot to wear the pendant during a visit. Can we try it? Right now, asked Holcomb, sitting down at her kitchen table. Not much sense in that. I already know you're here. But we could try it on my sister or something. The witch nodded. Good idea. Are you and your sister very close? Sure, Lara said. Have you told her about me? You mean the witch stuff? The witch stuff. No, she mostly stays in her room with the door locked on the phone or the computer. Holcomb nodded. She went to the stove and turned it down. She glanced back. What do the neighborhood children say about me? I don't know, Lara said. Some of them feel sorry for you. They say your husband died and you never got over it. Is that true? The old woman peered into the middle distance. Partly... He is dead. Mostly. Lara nodded. I remember there was one kid, Alan Bunting or Alex Bunting, when we first moved in. Albert, Holcomb said. Right. He said you were a witch and that we had to be careful living next to you or you'd eat us. Did he now? Holcomb ran a dark tongue across her teeth, her expression unreadable. Yeah, but we didn't believe him. Pretty soon after that, he went off to live with his dad or grandparents or something. The witch nodded. Yes, his step-parents was the story they told people. Lara paused, scrutinizing that old-slash-young face for some kind of deeper meaning. He didn't move away? In a manner of speaking, the old woman said, and met Lara's gaze. Her eyes danced with some kind of light as though she was standing in front of a fireworks display. Lara's mouth went dry. She swallowed to moisten it, and it made a creaking sound, oh. like a toad. You... you wouldn't do anything like that to me, she whispered. No, the witch said. Of course not. The rest of the lesson, Lara was distracted. It wasn't so fun anymore, having thought about Albert Bunting, who had been a plump, red-haired boy with a big dog. She wondered if witches really did eat fat little boys like in the fairy tales, and if a skinny girl like her would be tempting in the least bit. Old Widow Holcomb showed her how to mix the toadstool paste, how to bless it, or whatever you called it, and explained how long it would stay effective, then put a gentle hand on her shoulder. Don't you worry yourself about the bunting boy. You and I are different. 
closer. I... Lara began, intending to say she had no idea what Holcomb was talking about, but couldn't bring herself to say it. The witch removed her hand and said, Your mother will ask you what we talked about, what we did. She went to the oven, opened it, and brought out a cool tray of warm cookies. Thank you for helping with the recipes. Enjoy the cookies, you and yours. Lara's defenses went up. When had she made those cookies? They did smell delicious, with some kind of cinnamon and apple sprinkled over them, but until Holcomb had mentioned them, there had been no smell in the air, no warmth from the oven. What might be in a batch of cookies like that? You... Lara began. She cleared her throat and stood a little straighter. You should tell me if there's anything wrong with those cookies. I should, the witch agreed. She shrugged, almost embarrassed. Too much sugar and starch, really. Fattening, tooth decaying, and somewhat habit-forming. Right, Lara said. But nothing magically bad or dangerous? The witch frowned, finally realizing what she was being asked. No, nothing. Can there be no trust between us, child? Lara didn't answer that. She was basically blackmailing the woman into teaching her, and if not for that, they wouldn't even be speaking. I'll leave you alone, you know, Lara said. If you'll teach me just a little bit more. <sighs> Holcomb sighed, suddenly tired. I don't want you to leave me alone, girl. It's been nice having you come and visit. Lara couldn't believe her, and wasn't sure if she wanted to try. You won't hurt me or my family, she said solidly. It wasn't a question. Wouldn't dream of it, the witch said. She patted Lara's shoulder again. Put it out of your mind. Lara ended up sharing the cookies with her family but warned them that they might not taste right, since she'd made them herself. Tell me if they smell funny or taste wrong, okay? She told her mom. They went outside, and the sun was shining, the breeze was blowing, and two of those omnipresent white butterflies seemed to be doing battle on the lawn. Lara lagged a bit behind, because she had stopped to scoop a fingertip full of old widow Holcomb's toadstool formula from the jar. She sniffed it, hesitantly. If it smelled like butt, would she want to put it on her face? But it only smelled like freshly dug dirt, and a bit like Campbell's cream of mushroom soup. So she went ahead and stuck it on her forehead, making a circle with it as the witch had instructed. I don't have to draw an upside-down star in the circle. She had asked her neighbor. The thought that this was not only magic, but devil-related magic, frightened her. Not to my knowledge, had been the reply. Then an askance look. But it couldn't hurt to try. Lara hadn't known if the old woman was joking, or even if the witch had a sense of humor. But she finished the circle as Emma went into the garage. What do I count to? her sister called. I don't care. Twenty, she called back. All right, Emma said, and began counting aloud. Lara looked around the front yard and saw a seven-foot pine tree along the side of the house, which, unless she got really lucky, would hide no one from her sister. She scampered over to the tree just as she heard her now teenage sister shout, Ready or not, here I come. It occurred to Lara that she still had the stolen pendant around her neck. Maybe Emma had never had a choice in coming out here and playing with her. It made her feel a bit sad, but not for long, because her sister came around the house, running toward her, her eyes going from the pine tree to Lara's face to the smaller pine tree beyond. She kept running. Hey, Lara said, only somewhat loud. Emma stopped spun around, and smiled big. 
Wow, I ran right past you, she said, laughing. She came over. <laughs> Do I have to tag you? I can't remember anymore. Nah, just find me. Now it's your turn to hide. I'll go in the garage. Okay, Emma said. But you've got something on your face. Might be from a bird. Gross, Laura said, and made to wipe it off. She didn't, though, and kept on moving toward the garage. When they were very little girls, Laura had never been good at hide-and-seek. Emma could crouch down and hold still for what seemed like forever, but Laura hadn't had that kind of patience. This time, though, she spied her big sister immediately, crouching behind the big green garbage barrel they put mown grass and pine needles in. She ran over and said, Gotcha! at no more than a normal volume. But Emma shrieked like a snake had bitten her. Uh, you scared me! She yelled, but was laughing about it. Guess you're it then, Lara said, and they traded places. This time, Lara wanted to be sure. So she went to the center of the back lawn, where there was nothing to hide behind, nothing to block any view, and sat down Indian-style in the grass. Emma did not find her. It didn't seem possible, but her sister, even walking a mere four feet away from her, never noticed her sitting there, but instead went from one hiding place to the other, finally heading back around the house for another pass. Lara sat there, thinking about all the possibilities of a cream that made you invisible, about the fun it could bring her, about the crimes someone armed with it might commit. Not that she would use it for evil. Not intentionally, anyway. But she wondered if the magic itself was an evil thing, like the witch next door had appeared to be. Or if magic was just a tool, like electricity or a car that could be used or misused for evil purposes. She got up, called Emma's name, and found her inside the house, rooting around in the fridge for an apple. Did you give up? She asked. You cheated, Emma said, barely glancing up at her. You went back in the house. I didn't. Well, you weren't anywhere outside. I looked. I was outside. You just wait. Did you get inside one of the garbage cans? Emma asked, her nose wrinkling. That's really gross. I guess you should have looked there, Lara said, and headed upstairs to her room. She wanted to tell her sister about the magic. And she would. Just not now. On Saturday, Lara went next door again, and old Lady Holcomb met her on the porch. It was as though she expected her, was just waiting there for her shadow to cross the doorway. I've got something for you, child, she said, entering the living room, beckoning the girl to follow. What? She went to a cabinet above what might have been a record player, had it not been the size of a vanity or chest of drawers. From within, she removed a small, quarter-sized object and placed it in Lara's hands. It was a seashell. Not just any seashell, but a bewitched one. Okay. The old woman brought down an identical one and held it in her hand. She whispered something into it. My cousin and I used to use these to keep in touch when school was in session and we were miles apart. The seashell whispered in Holcomb's voice. Wait, what? Speak into it. Lara did. What does it do again? She said into her seashell. What does it do again? Her voice came through the other seashell a split second later. They relay messages through each other, no matter where you are in the world, the witch said proudly. Like walkie-talkies? They don't take batteries, Laura, and if you pick up your shell an hour after I've spoken into mine, you will still hear my messages. So, like a cell phone? Laura asked, unimpressed. Well, yes, the witch admitted. But it will only work for you and the person you designate. To anyone else, it's just a seashell. Lara nodded. Does it play music? 
It could, the witch said, if you hold one up to a phonograph or radio. Well, that's cool, I guess. These are for me. Yes, you can use it to talk to someone in secret. No need to sneak around at night. Lara nodded again. She did have a friend from her old school she missed now that she only saw her once or twice a year. And she never emailed. Well, thanks, Lara said. That's really useful, especially before cell phones or texting were invented. Right, the witch said. And it almost sounded like her feelings were hurt. Almost. Did you try the hiding spell, then? Yes, at school yesterday. I got marked absent, even though I had said I was there. I had to talk to the teacher during recess. Oh, you poor thing. So, what are you going to teach me today? I thought we could try a couple of love spells, for when you get older. Now Lara was impressed. Really? A real love spell? The witch half nodded, half shook her head. Well, a real love spell is difficult. More specialized magic. These are infatuation charms, mostly harmless. So I could make boys fall in love with me? For a while? Or each other? For a while. And could I make girls fall in love with boys? Surely all people in love fall out of love with each other. Or your parents, if they considered separation, you could reunite them. And how about animals? The woman squinted. What do you refer to? Like, could I make Melissa Chittister fall in love with a dog? Or a Shetland pony? The old woman's squint got deeper. Then she began to laugh. It was an infectious sound, and Lara couldn't help but laugh as well. <laughs> yes. Holcomb said finally. I suppose it could. It's been a while since I've put a spell to that kind of misuse. She kept smiling for a while, and Lara wondered what the old woman had been like when she was her age. She wondered what the world had been like back then. How old a lady are you, Mrs. Holcomb? That is not a polite question, child. And once one reaches a certain age, it behooves one not to keep track. Oh, Lara said, not understanding what one or behooves meant. Holcomb put her hand on Lara's shoulder. Let's just say that your grandparents might have called me Old Widow Holcomb, had that been my name in those days. The next day at school... Lara kept two twigs in her backpack, both blessed, or whatever the word was, by the witch for a fun love spell, as she had requested. All she had to do was say the name of the person the spell was cast on, snap the twig, and that victim, or whatever you called it, would fall for the next person they saw. To break the spell, Lara needed to snap the twig again. And what happens if you break it a third time? She'd asked the day before. The witch had leaned in, all conspiratorial. The stick gets even smaller, she had said. I before E except after C, Holly Adamson answered, pleasing Mr. Chadwick as usual. Lara rolled her eyes. Holly had been teacher's pet all year, always knowing the answer, always hugging the credit. Lara glanced at her backpack, considering briefly casting the spell on Holly. But chances were she was already in love with Mr. C, who was a little handsome, in a Dr. House sort of way. No, the fun might be casting the spell on Mr. Chadwick, just to see what that would be like. But what if he humiliated himself and lost the respect of all the class? Or worse, what if he started making out with a fifth grader and got fired from his job? Lara decided to wait until recess, just to be safe. She followed Holly into the coat room and out the door, said, Thanks, Holly, and snapped the twig. Holly stopped in her tracks, as though she'd forgotten something. Wade Perry came barreling out the door and plowed into Holly. He was an oaf, and as such, he didn't apologize. 
Holly looked at him, as if to give him a piece of her mind, then stopped. Something new came into her eyes, it seemed to Lara. And Holly said, You watch who you're crashing into, Wade. I might start to cry and then you'll have to kiss it better. Wade was puzzled. He really wanted to get to the monkey bars. Guess what better? Holly batted her eyelashes. Come over here and find out. Lara went to the swings and watched Holly Adamson and Wade from afar. They talked for a long time and then went to the monkey bars together. Before recess was over, they were holding hands. When the bell rang, Wade opened the coat room door for Holly, an expression of joy and optimism on his face. Lara had intended to break the spell the moment that would be most embarrassing for Holly, like if they were smooching in class or something. But now she wasn't sure what to do. Wade Perry was a jerk and a bully, but maybe he was putting on an act, or lashing out because he was unhappy or lonely. She put the twig back in her backpack not breaking it a second time. Right after school, Lara went to old Widow Holcomb's place and knocked on the door. The witch opened it and looked down at her, smiling. My, but you're here early today, aren't you? I thought I'd give you something, she said. She reached into her pocket and pulled out one of the bewitched seashells. She handed it over. A pining shell? The old woman said. Didn't it work? I don't know. I never tried it. Lara shook her head. On the bus home, I thought it would be cool to talk to you, but I don't have a cell phone. So I thought if you had one and I had one. The witch nodded, inviting Lara inside. That's very nice of you, Lara. The girl shrugged. She went into the kitchen and sat down at the table. Holcomb followed her, trying to get a look at her face. How was your day, child? Fine. We had a spelling test. I couldn't remember how to spell deceive. I before E except after C, the witch said. What? Don't they teach that any more? Maybe. Laura mumbled, distracted. I don't know. What troubles you, Laura Deming? asked the witch. Nothing. I just... How long does a love spell last? A love spell? Like the infatuation charm from yesterday? Or a real love spell? The one with the sticks. If you don't break the twig to put an end to it, ten hours or so. Maybe twelve, depending on the target. She put a hand on the girl's back. You didn't cast it on yourself, did you, Laura? The girl looked up at her. No, why? What would happen? The witch chuckled. <laughs> Morose behavior, mooning, sighing, distraction like you're exhibiting now. Oh, and what happens when you break the spell? To the person that was in love? What do you mean? It's a harmless charm, girl. Nothing dangerous, if that's what you're asking. Does the person who I cast it on hate the person they were in love with? The witch sat down in the chair beside her, offering a few shelled peanuts from a bowl, then gobbling a couple up herself. No, not if it wears off on its own. If you break the spell in the usual way, it's like waking from a dream. The infatuation goes away, but the recipient doesn't realize they were under a charm. Are you worried a boy will dislike you tomorrow? I didn't cast it on a boy, Lara said. Ah, well, in this modern world, love can bloom in many colors. Lara went quiet again, not really listening. Perhaps I was wrong to teach you that one, child. Next time we'll tackle something simpler, like the eye color charm. About that... Lara stared at her hands for a minute, looking from finger to finger. Lara? The old woman said, leaning closer to her across the table. I... I... 
I don't think you have to teach me any more. I... Has something happened, girl? No, I just think you've taught me enough. You don't have to show me any more spells. I won't tell anyone what you did. Child, I didn't think you would. You would have divulged by now if you were going to. The witch lowered her voice, and there seemed to be something motherly there, something almost tender. Do you not wish to learn any more magic? Yes, I do, but... Again, Lara started staring into space. How about I teach you a few more spells, here and there, and you can quit any time you like? She remembered the feeling she got when her sister had run right past her in their hide-and-seek game, a combination of pride and disbelief. And Lara wanted to say yes. It was fun to learn magic, and it made her feel special, powerful. But she had to quit before she got too deep into it before she let it go to her head, or she took it too far. No, that's okay. Thanks, though. All right, the witch said. I suppose that would be best. Lara nodded. For some reason, she felt like crying. She stood up. Thanks for everything. Never mind that. Thanks for the company. The witch went to the counter and picked up the enchanted seashell. I suppose I should give this back to you, Holcomb said. Lara looked at it. She hadn't even had a chance to try it out. Do you really want to keep teaching me spells? She asked. Before the old woman could answer, Lara reached into her shirt and pulled out the pendant. I mean, if I wasn't wearing this necklace, would you? I don't know. All I can say is that I've enjoyed our visits these past few days, and I find myself looking forward to them even when I'm outside its sphere of influence. Lara thought about that. She wanted to believe the witch, but she had to remember what she had seen that first night and remind herself what, exactly, old Widow Holcomb was. Keep the shell, Lara said at last. If you want to teach me something tomorrow or the next day, call me over. But only if you want to. The witch looked at her, in thought. Then she smiled. It appeared genuine. That sounds fine. Thank you for the gift. Well, you gave it to me first, Lara said. I suppose I did. Lara left the Holcomb house with a spring in her step. She felt better about a lot of things. Old Widow Holcomb was casting an unclog hex on her upstairs toilet when she thought she heard the doorbell ring. She cocked her head and definitely heard a noise from below. A knock at the door. She carefully went down the stairs and started through the hall when a voice in her kitchen said, Mrs. Holcomb? Mrs. Holcomb? Mrs. Holcomb, are you there? She backtracked into the kitchen, looking around for the child. No one was there, but Lara's voice asked for her once again from the seashell on the counter. Mrs. Holcomb? Of course. Yes, child, I'm here. Hi, it's me, Lara's voice said. Yes, is anything wrong? No, I just... I wondered if you wanted me to come over and make something with you. Make something? Well, I was going to go into the woods today. To look for mushrooms? No. I... Are you alone? I'm in my room, yes. The witch nodded. I put an entrapment circle there the other night, and I was going to check for fairies. Fairies? Really? Holcomb couldn't see it, but Lara had stood up, bumping her knee sharply on the underside of her desk. Through the pain, the girl asked, Fairies, Fairies are, real? are real? Of course they're real, the woman said, turning to look at the house next door, as though Lara could sense her glare. 
Don't all little girls believe in fairies any more? Some, Some of them, them do, do, Lara replied. I'm not really a little girl anymore. No, no, you're practically geriatric, Laura, she said, which Lara didn't get. You'll, You'll catch, catch fairies, fairies today? today? Them or their droppings. I could use both. Fairies, fairies leave, leave droppings? droppings? Lara asked, wrinkling her nose. They do. Gross. Gross. I suppose, but very useful. Would you care to come? Sure, sure, the girl said excitedly. She was already scrambling for her shoes. Holcomb found herself smiling and told the child to come over in ten minutes or so. It was strange the way her attitude had changed about the neighbor girl. After the death of her son, Holcomb had given up the idea of ever having children, and had closed off a part of herself to even enjoying their company. But she did enjoy Lara's company, despite the little brat's attempts at blackmail. Life could be surprising, even after a hundred years. The witch opened her front door and found a cardboard box at her doorstep. The UPS man had been there, had been the one ringing her bell, in fact and had made a delivery. There was no name on the return address, but Holcomb thought she knew what was inside. She brought the box in and suggested it open itself up to her. The packing tape withstood the first attempt, then split itself down the middle on her second. The box gave off an unpleasant odor, and it brought back memories of her time in the old country, so long ago, but suddenly so vivid. Most of the box was filler, crumpled newspaper, and packing peanuts. But beneath all that, and covered in bubble wrap, was a small metal object. So, Aldreth had found another one. Hadn't taken so long as she had predicted, either. Holcomb took off the bubble wrap and admired the Dije de Espindola. The pendant was shinier than the one she'd lost, and the jewel was cleaner more pure. Not bad, the witch said. Not bad. She took the necklace and put it around her neck, tucking it down into her blouse. It felt warm there, at home. The End everybody welcome back do we need a cast list did we do a cast list last time we did and it was just us you me and and brian mm. brian berton mm. oh she's french i don't know what she is actually yeah it sounds french though it probably is oh yeah yeah, yeah. we haven't done this in a while have we feels like we're not firing on all cylinders <sighs> <laughs> Well, like, yeah, we're just out of practice. I, I, I haven't been at your house in a while, it feels like. Yeah. What, what was the last thing we recorded here? My chair is creaking a lot. That's Does it show up on the audio? I don't know. Tell us if it shows up on the audio in the comments, all right, folks? That would be don't, awesome. Don't do that, because there's nothing we can do about it at that point. <laughs> all right, so we've actually heard the whole story now. So we can talk all about it, and not just about the title of it, or the inspiration story the, yeah, the the long and drawn out story that led up to the creation of the uh, of the piece but now it's been months since i listened to the story yeah so what do we do do i remember what happened in the story hell no I, I, <laughs> <laughs> there was mention of the uh what <sighs> I, uh, what's the Spanish word for it? The something of espindola. El dije de, de espindola. Dije de espindola. Espindola now has become one of your favorite last names. Um, <laughs> Many years ago it was. But right. I, I haven't used it in so, so long. What was the other one I liked? Was it Forco? Oh, yeah, Forco. I think that one, wasn't that one in here too? 
Was Mr. the teacher Forco. Mr. Forco? I think you voiced Mr. Forco. Did I? Sweet. Uh, yeah, those are funny because those are players that used to be on my favorite soccer team. There was a guy named Spindola and a guy named Forco on the team. And uh, <laughs> cracks me up to hear them brought, uh, especially Forco. That guy's been gone for like, I don't know. How long have we been doing the show? Eight nine years, years. Nine years. So probably eight years that he's been gone. Maybe more. I wouldn't be surprised if he was off the team before the show ever even started. Maybe, but the, this story would not have been written if it hadn't been for our podcast. So couldn't have been before. Yeah. Well, no, I'm not saying that. The, but yeah, he hasn't been on the team for a long time. Willis Forco. Was he really Willis Forco? Yeah. Come on, that doesn't work. <laughs> it's got to be like... Rodrigo Forco or something like that. Well, it's, it's Forco with a K, though. Oh, it is with a K. They don't have Ks in Spanish, do they? Unless, well, you're, what? unless you're counting Q-U-E. Okay. Okay, but that's the only thing that you got from it is that I named two. No, it's there just the two. first thing coming back to me. And yeah, it just it always kind of makes me laugh because you have a tendency to uh, latch on to certain names Mm. and then use them here and there and again and again and then and they're always fun names you know and i don't know if that's just a, a thing of yours if you i've noticed especially recently now that i've started writing more often i feel like i collect names when i see a name that's unusual i think "Ooh, i gotta use that one and i put it aside there's one that i actually some big uppity up in the company that i work for in the in the national office or whatever sent out an email to everybody and oh my gosh I wish I could remember what his name was it was out of control and I'm like oh that's it <laughs> the guy's name his last name is Shiakatano spelt S-C-I-A-C-K-I-T-A-N-O and I thought oh I gotta use that one that one's awesome I love that name see um, so you do it too it's not just me it's a new thing I think I, I haven't always done that because I, I, also I haven't written very much you know so when you hear a name and then you're like oh yeah i need to use that and then you don't write something for a year you mm. forget the name there is a uh, name that i saw once where uh i thought oh i've got to use that there, there's a an idea i had once for a steampunk uh novel and i thought oh the lead character in that uh novel need, needs to be named penny Hepworth, because I thought that sounds so very like 18th century English or something. So I put that one in there. That's I I, saw, I sent a package to a woman and her name was Cleopatra Tovar. And I texted you. I was like, dude, what do you think of the name Cleopatra Tovar? I mean, I mean that, that's such a strange name that yeah, it would be right at home next to Penny. Hepworth. Hepworth. I, well, in a steampunk or a... I, yeah. I, yeah, I put it in a sci-fi story. Nice. Cleopatra Tovar. Yeah, it's. I just I just like doing that when I hear a name that's interesting. Mostly a last name. You know, I'm not saving the first name usually because you don't want to use the first name. Because you get in trouble name. for that. We might get in trouble. We might be in trouble just for mentioning those last two names. Are they... I mean, they're real people. <laughs> So maybe we should cut that out. But wait, well, why does that matter? I mean, did we say something against those people? No. But now everybody is Googling them and sending them death threats because that's what you do on the Internet. Okay, but they're the ones that are doing something wrong. <laughs> Doesn't matter. You get in trouble because you're the one who ever first mentioned their name. That's the way it also works <sighs> on the Internet. Uh, anyways. Yeah, I don't know. I just I, I find that interesting to do. I... I started just kind of watching and the other thing that i also like to do is just use names of did i mention this on the bank it's my goat or something when people donate to the show i basically take their name and think okay i'm gonna use that in a story yeah you you did mention that i think it was when we were talking about patreon either it was you or or me know of somebody who at a certain tier of their patreon supporter if you are that at that level, they will kill you in one of the things that they <laughs> nice. write. And I mean, it's, it's like a perk. It's not a, you know, it's not like me taking Cleo Tovar and, and ruining her life in the same way. <laughs> yeah, you, have you heard the story of John Burns' school friend named Kitty Pride? 
and he named an X-Men character after her, and her life was a living hell after that. Why? How did it because just because people heard it? Because it was such a unique name, Kitty Pride, that people would be like, "Oh my gosh, you know what? There's an X." And yes, I know there's an X Man. But, but and it's just like, yes, I went to school with John Byrne, and he named the character. And yeah, at some point she like started going by Catherine Pride, or like changed her last name, or because she yes. hated the attention. And I never really got that. It's like you hate the attention. Kitty Pride's a beloved character, and you inspired her. But I guess. There are two sides to fame. You know, there's always the people that can't wait to be famous. And then once they're famous, it's like, oh, somebody asked me for an autograph while I was at the now drinking I fountain. I can't go out without oh. putting on a disguise. I can't go to the gym not wearing a bra without something. And you're just like, oh, okay. Sorry. Yeah. You, you, you wanted this so bad that you pushed down so many people to get here. <laughs> I saw a news story once uh, about... Cosplay not being consent. No. Probably saw one about that too, but uh, I saw one about people who were named Harry Potter. Mm. And yeah, they went around, found these people, interviewed them, talked to them about what it's like being named Harry Potter now that Harry Potter is a thing. And uh, most of them, probably all of them in this story, were not named after Harry Potter. You know what I mean? They were just named Harry Potter and then Harry Potter came along Many of them really didn't, you know. This guy's like sixty years old. And he's like, yeah, I mean, I, I never read him. I, I did. I, I like looked it up on the internet after people started saying it to me all the time. So I'm kind of familiar with it, but. But for those people, having that name has been a living hell. I don't think so. I don't think it's that bad. It's not like Kitty Pride reacted to it. It's just a, oh yeah, people always say this. It's like being named Michael Jackson or something, you know? I mean, it's, they're two very common names, so you know there's going to be a lot of people named Michael Jackson out there. But, you know, you just got to deal with it. <laughs> Go by Mike or whatever. <laughs> we had a story on that. Um, years ago, when I was in L.A. and really wanted to be a screenwriter or something, I'm trying to remember who it was that said it. Maybe it was just a book on screenwriting I was reading, or maybe it was our screenwriting teacher in the class that you and I had, said that legally... You had to be able, whenever you named a character on a television series or in a movie or something like that, the legal department had to be able to prove that there was more than one person with that name. And when Star Trek Enterprise was starting, Captain Archer's first name was Jackson Archer. And they found a guy in Minnesota or Ohio or whatever named Jackson Archer, but it was just one guy. And Paramount says, you got to change it because this guy will be able to say, oh, you, this is based on me or you guys owe me royalties or this has harmed me in some way. But if there are, is more than one guy with the name Jackson Archer, it's OK, because legally you can always say, well, it's not that Jackson Archer. And so, yeah, they, they changed it to um, Cleopatra Archer. <laughs> Jonathan Archer is, is what they changed it to at, when Scott Bakula was playing him. Um, because there were plenty of Jonathan Archers. And yeah, that to me was just so strange. Because you would think that you have just absolute freedom with naming your characters. Yeah, you would think so. I saw the same thing, or heard the same thing, in a like a commentary or, or, or a documentary or something like that. An interview about Community, the TV show, where they had to basically say, the show takes place here. I mean, they shot almost the entire thing in L.A., but in the show, it actually takes place in Colorado. I think even the, the whole, like, first season or something like that, they would, like, hide the palm trees and make them look like evergreens or something like that whenever they did the wide shots of the campus. Eventually, they just stopped caring. But it's supposed to take place in Colorado, and they had to do that so that when they named people, they had, you know... A state to say, Colorado, this is where it's happening, and there's this many people with this name in there, so we don't have to worry about somebody doing exactly what you were saying about the Cleopatra Archer thing. But Jeff Winger, if your name was Jeff Winger, and they didn't establish that it was in Colorado, you would have a case or something? Or they they were liable for, or they, they might get sued? Something like that, yeah. They had to basically say it's taking place here so that they could look in that area and make sure there was that many. 
because they didn't ever come out and say like the Simpsons. You know, you don't know where Springfield is, although it's Oregon. Um. See, all that kind of stuff is so strange. I, at this point, the that gets my goat. The big announcement that gets my goat has aired. And we talk a little bit about that, about f- being afraid of what you say on the air and what what could get you in trouble, what could come back to bite you, a joke that you make that somebody takes out of context or in context, but they have no sense of humor or maybe, you know, it was a nasty thing that you said or whatever it is, you know, you never know. I mean, we are just, we're the, the very tip of the angel dancing on the head of a pin of the entertainment industry, what we are doing. <laughs> and so... I don't imagine, you know, anything that we'd say or do will ever harm us. Although uh, I told you that my uncle at one point said, hey, I didn't appreciate what you said about me on the podcast. Um, although that was what a... What the hell are you doing listening to That it? was a, a podcast that dares not speak its name, which has an even oh, smaller wow. listenership. So it's just well, like, he wow. He was the one listener that week, huh? Yeah, I guess. Wow. That, that was a mistake. But yeah, I mean, we talk about that sometimes, you know, the consequences and, and, and you know, how free are you... How anonymous are you on the internet? And Because podcasting is still a really new thing. I mean, for us, it seems like it was just invented. I mean, if you're 20 years old, you're like, well, it's been around practically my whole life. <laughs> but people are still trying to figure out how this works. And there are still faceless corporations saying, can we make money from this? I, 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 let's let it go for a little while and focus on the things that can just bring us bushels of cash barrels of cash bags body bags filled with cash instead of dead bodies i don't know they're they're morbid these people in the office there. yeah well they're faceless so yeah and that's got to be really hard uh-huh. because it just you know, one of those things that makes you kind of morbid you get up each so. morning and you look in the mirror and you go man someday maybe the face will grow in some days that i don't even know how i'm saying this because i don't have a mouth well, i have no mouth but i must scream I, I'm not really sure how we got on this. I guess we're still talking about Forco. Mr. Forco. Go Forco. Uh, so. Yeah, uh, I, I, I enjoyed the names getting thrown in there. I think I especially enjoyed it because this story is yeah, it's relatively old. <laughs> it's been around a while, but I hadn't read it yet. So, you know, when I got to ex- experience it, it was a first for me, and it was fun to hear those old names come up. Also to consider the fact that I've started doing stupid things like that, too. Just collecting names that I can use someday. But sometimes you'll stumble across something that you wrote a long time ago. And you don't really remember the details, so you read through it again. And there'll be a a line or a reference or a song quote or a character name or whatever. And you'll be like, I know why that's in there. It's (laughs) like, oh, I had a crush on a girl named... Tobias Bacall. Uh, you know, I just, wow, I, I, that's, that's why that's in there. Wow, that's, holy cow, I only knew her from, you know, this or that. Or it's just like, oh, yeah, he's going to his job at so-and-so. It's like, I lasted six weeks at that job. That's amazing. They, I must have written it just right then. Uh, that sort of thing is kind of fun. The little time capsule of where you were, who you were when you wrote it. And, yeah, I, I, that stuff comes up a lot for me because a lot of my stories are in the notebooks. And it's oh, not right. until I dig them out and finally type, type them, them up, up, which can be years and years later that anybody can see them. And so they take place in a world where a four-year-old doesn't have a cell phone. In a world where a four-year-old doesn't have a cell phone. What madness accompanies every... You know, I just like... What? I feel kind of bad that we are in a world where a four-year-old does have a cell phone. I, it was only like four or five years ago when that stuff used to just be like, What? It's like, you're buying a tablet for a two-year-old? Uh, uh, but now it's just like, sorry, I mean, what? what are you, uh, you want Child Protective Services to knock down your door? Yeah, your one-year-old gets a tablet. <laughs> but yeah, it wasn't that long ago that it was just like, what? What does a fifth grader need a cell phone for? Yeah, I remember when you told me that story about how your uh, relative was scolded for not having My uncle his, was, yeah. Uh, Child his daughter, cell phone. his elementary school age daughter, a cell phone. And they're like, well, if what? she had her own phone, this wouldn't have happened. She's like, yeah, but she's she's a child. I got to be kidding, right? Now you uh, mentioned one other title uh, that you had forgotten to mention the last time around. You couldn't remember it. Well, I mentioned, like a good neighbor, Lara and the Witch, and uh, Neighborhood it? Watch. 
believe it or not. Yeah. That was actually one of the titles. That That's you, a good title. Was it named? Was it actually called that for a while? Or no, I just, I had it just in. one of the options. I had it in my notebook. I've got one in my hand. This is not a video podcast, so why the hell am I doing this? But sometimes Ooh, at the top. It, flip it. Okay, look, look, look. Right here is a story called, called Lost and Found that I wrote. But under Lost and Found was the alternate title, Finder of Lost Children. Mm. Which was a, a title, and uh, you know, I was like, oh, I, I could call it that. And yeah, that's something that just happens in these notebooks is like while I'm writing it, I'm like, oh, I could call this this. Or I... Hey, before you put that away, just to make it worthwhile, flip it real close to the mic so we actually hear the pages turn. Okay, so that, that was worth it now. Thanks for getting that out. Uh, has any of this episode been worth it? <laughs> uh, yeah, we, we, well, we talked a great deal about titles in the last episode. And in a, a recent, I guess my goat, where we talked about girl. Titles with girl in them. But yeah, believe it or not, where does that come from? Either the uh, Greatest American Hero song or Ripley's Believe It or Not. Which, sadly, that's what I thought well done. first it was, was the Ripley's. It was Ripley's Believe It or Not, but it also worked as a... Song title there. because, yeah, the theme from The Greatest American Hero, which is still the best theme song for a television series of all time. Probably true. Did we name, we didn't name it the best when we did. Do you remember? I'm like, sure we did. First season we when did. we did a when we do top, the top five, five list. list. Oh, I, I absolutely would have put that as my number one. I'm sure. Yeah. And I, we probably would have sang it together at the end of the episode. <laughs> But it would be fun to go back and listen to that and see if our uh, opinions have changed. Because I'm, I'm sure one of us put the Cheers theme. I, Sometimes I know Punky you want to go. Oh, my gosh. That was one of my favorites. Because I couldn't remember Punky Brewster. And I was like, how does it go? And you started to sing it. I and it came flooding thing. back to me as though I had known it my whole life. Because, I mean, I guess I had. But once I hit adulthood, once my uh, uh, Logan's Run crystal had started to glow, I forgot that I ever knew the Punky Brewster theme. Um, and I know there's got to be one listener out there that's been with us throughout all the episodes that is just hoping that we sing the, <laughs> the Punky Brewster theme. But the truth is, I can't remember how it goes. All I remember is, Hey, Brandon, it's going on. Punky. All you remember is Glomer. Admit it. That's, I do remember Glomer, but I think that was a totally different yeah, song. Yeah, he was in the cartoons and um, had a different song. It was Punky. Like, was like the difference between the uh, Ghostbusters and then the real Ghostbusters. Although I think they just used the same song for the cartoon, so that doesn't count. Eh, it was like the difference between Rambo and Rambo the cartoon. Isn't that weird? That's one of those things that's still... I saw the real Ghostbusters has appeared on Netflix the other day. My son was watching it the other day. So oh, that's interesting. I mean, Ghostbusters, not like it was a super dirty movie or anything like that but it wasn't for kids and then they made it a cartoon because i guess it became such a cultural phenomenon that everybody just loved it and you could make a cartoon out of it i mean i think that's okay that's acceptable with ghostbusters but where you're going rambo. toward is rambo first blood part two <laughs> rambo was an r-rated very very violent car or movie and then they turned it into a cartoon. Rambo, the force of freedom cartoon. Is that real? Is that what the theme was? Yes. Holy cow. So you watched it. Because, yeah, you and I would have been too young to see, well, to legally go see <laughs> Rambo First Blood Part 2 when, I mean, if the cartoon came out like a year or two later, or five. <clears throat> and, yeah, I, in those days, I, there might have been a couple of eyebrows that waggled when that cartoon came out. But... The whole era of you could make a cartoon to sell toys, or you make a cartoon based on anything, was was so new in the 80s that, yeah, they probably were just like, yeah, oh, yeah, we'll try that. Oh, nobody can play. Let's do a Robocop one, you know. <laughs> they did. <laughs> Which was another unbelievably, that's even, I mean, way worse, I would say, than even Rambo, because they were specifically trying to make it as gory as possible. Yeah, I'd say Blood. RoboCop is violent by like, today's standards. One of the one of my favorite things on the uh, Honest Trailers review of RoboCop, like the the remake of RoboCop came out, and they're like, they want us to do RoboCop. So, well, who gives a fuck about the new one? Let's do the old one. Oh. So they did one about the old one, and they talked to it, and they're like, and this movie, and they get to the one point where they say it's got the most 
blood squibs ever. And then they just do this endless montage with the uh, In the Hall of the Mountain King playing behind it. (laughs) (laughs) As just all these bodies are just being mutilated on screen. And oh my gosh, they made that in a cartoon. It's just ridiculous to think about. But yeah, they did. Well, nowadays, I think people wouldn't freak out so much. Because there's not the huge stigma of cartoon equals little kid. That's true. Although that still exists for some people. People over a certain age are just like, well, there was titties in that Japanese cartoon he was watching. I was like, yeah, it was also in Japanese with English subtitles. I don't care. It was a cartoon. (laughs) And rated X. So maybe you ought to check a little bit before you put it on. You found it in the hentai section, <laughs> not even the anime section. I mean, come on. Uh. Well, do, do you, when we were kids, I mean, I don't know if, if you were a big movie fan as a kid and you would try and get your parents to rent you stuff. Um, but yeah, I'd do everything I could to see R-rated movies, to have, you know, my my, my mom wouldn't rent it. Well, maybe I could trick my grandma into renting it. <laughs> and... You'd pay so much attention to like the ratings and what, you know, like when Robocop came out and it originally got an X rating, that was news. I was like, holy cow, I've got to see this movie. It's like, whoa, it got an X rating for violence. Whoa, how violent must that be? And, um, but now that I'm old, I don't give a f- Wow, what was that noise? It was just the sensor beeping the F word that I said. Sorry. Okay, yeah, well, I think I said. The- well, let's both say it, and that way we'll know. Ready? I, I was going to say, okay, but now that I'm a grown-up, I don't care about... I, I don't care so much. I, every once in a while, I'll see like a movie like Knowing, or, or you'll see a movie like Taken, where those are, Knowing and Taken are R-rated movies that got PG-13s, and then I'm just like, well, that's, that's peculiar. How does that happen? <laughs> or a movie like Saving Private Ryan, where he's just like, that got an R? What gets an NC-17 then? But, saving Ryan's private. There sense. you go. But most of the time, I don't care. But I'm thinking because you still have children of beating age, are the ratings a big deal? Uh, you know, what is this cartoon? What is they? What do they sing about this cartoon? He's like, yeah. Oh, he's watching one of those Japanese animes. <laughs> Not too much. My kid did ask me the other day if she could go and see Logan. And I said, mm, he, that's, no, probably not. That's that's a little much, I, I think. You're only 13. Well, I, are there theaters that will let her in? No, but I mean, there. Were, I think there are theaters that were, would let her in with me. Oh, well, yeah, they, they should but, all. Yeah, I, I had to say no. But yeah, like, how is your son five? Yeah. What What is your reaction when he's like, I want to watch the one on Netflix, the, the Japanese cartoon, where they make this Japanese schoolgirl pee herself. And you're like, well, son, that could be any number of anime. I'm just, I'm just curious, you know, you being a father, if you're more sensitive about that stuff again. Or, you know, it's just like, I watched this and I wondered if, you know, it's appropriate for the kid. You know, your daughter wants to see Logan. What would the fallout be if she saw Logan? What 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 is your... Why did you tell her, no, it's probably not a good idea? It's just overly violent for her. You know, I would prefer her be a little older before she gets to, to that kind of stuff. It wouldn't be a huge fallout or anything like that. But uh, And when it comes down to it, I'm sure she's seen lots of relatively violent stuff. I mean, hell, you get really violent stuff just on TV anymore. She's watched all sorts of episodes of, like, Bones and stuff like that where they've got, like, charred mangled corpses that they're like let's examine this oh see this carbon scoring here looks like you boys have seen a lot of action i don't know what with david boreanaz and all just i don't i don't know how how big of a deal it would be or not i mean i was a little surprised here and there i mean you we talked about when the when wolverine stuck his claws into the guy's armpit where we just went oh that has to be the worst of all, for some reason. <laughs> Despite well, jamming his claws through the top of someone's skull, up through their jaw, you know, the other way through their skull, cutting off arms like whole, etc. For some reason, that one was the worst, but... For me, I mean, maybe you felt differently. 
but just all the time, I mean, it was pretty nasty. Sooner or later, she's going to see something like that. She doesn't have to when she's 13. It's probably best if we give her some time to be innocent. Well, she does watch anime. She so does. Yeah, no, she's... That ship has sailed. That's probably true. I don't know why we're talking about this. Is it? Are we still talking about the Rambo cartoon? Uh, yeah, that's probably where the tangent began or somewhere around there. I think it probably began before that. But anyways, uh, you wrote a story about this girl and a witch. Yes, I did. I thought it was pretty good. I hadn't heard it before, although I sort of known about it because, you know, you'd given me the uh, the premise, you know, a girl finds out her neighbor's a witch and so she blackmails her into uh, teaching her stuff. I don't know. I, I enjoyed it. And I was I was actually really sad when the ending came and uh, she's now gotten her own Pendejo de espindola. What is it? Pinche de espindola. What's the What's the word? Pinche. Really? What, that's funny. Do what you know any it? other Mexican swear words? You can puta de espindola. I can't. That, I, that's what she got. Yeah, she. I can't off. remember what the what the word was. She she collected enough uh, proofs of purchases that she could get another one. Right. That's right. You bought enough General Mills uh, breakfast <laughs> cereal boxes. You could get a dije de espindola. Oh, it was I, yeah, I, okay. the ending, oh, so you didn't like the ending? No, or? well, I mean, I I liked it, but I was kind of sad because I liked the relationship and I felt, I don't know, I you know, the, the girl, they, it became sort of a real relationship in the end and then she sort of releases her, so it, now we put it to the test and then in the end, oh, crap. Well, you know, you you and I, well, you more than me, but we you will come up with an idea for a story and it could be a year or two or three years before you finally finish that story. And yeah, with this one, the idea was always going to be at the very end, the spell gets broken and I was going to have it be, yeah, she gets her own pendant. And so the playing field is cleared now, evened, whatever they call it, evened uh-huh. out. The little girl can't tell her what to do anymore, and, and that, that would be the end of the story. But as I actually wrote it and was working toward that ending, yeah, I did start to have develop a little bit of affection for Lara in the witch's mind. And it still ends the same way, except for now, you can decide whether, whether she, she's going to actually whether make she murders use of it the or child not. or whether she continues to teach the child or you know or, or you can read one of the many stories i've written since then that have old lady holcomb in them and oh. find out exactly what did happen but yeah i just i made the mistake one time of starting to write a story with a witch in it and i thought why does it have to be any witch why can't it be the same witch and so now yeah it's always her always old lady holcomb is yeah. she the one that uh, sent the guy to play Santa Claus that one time? or No, no, that was before I ever wrote this. Okay, so this one was the first Old Lady Holcomb story yeah. in the series, in the quadrilogy. I didn't hey, see it. Maybe he said lick him. Did Could you? you lick Shane, Daddy? Could you lick him? Okay. And can I watch, Daddy? Did you go to Taco Bell? Today? Yeah, that's where oh, he came we, home from. When we he went to in Wendy's, room. and I considered going over there and making fun of you, and he told me not to. Okay. I'm still doing something as your father. See, yeah, I'm still worthwhile. No, I wouldn't go that far. <laughs> uh, um, no, no, wait, 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 wait. there aren't sequels to Started it. Over with the no, no, because I was making a stupid noise. Oh, okay. Go. What was the noise? Uh. I was trying to remember where we were. Go. Because uh, you just said quadrology or whatever. No, they're not sequels to Like a Good Neighbor. It's just uh, I have had... It could, you know how it is. It's fun to reference previous things that you've written and new things that you write and have the same character show up or, or you know, encounter... Or, or, you know, they both hear the same song or they drive past the same movie theater. You know, these things sure. come up over and over or because they... I enjoy setting them in the same town and just saying, yeah, maybe most of these stories all take place in the same area. And so, yeah, once I have a witch and I decided it would be Holcomb, I, you know, I dropped a couple of hints of what happened after 
this this oh time. okay cool well i look forward to reading the quadrology <laughs> Yeah, I guess I guess the ending is it, it's not a, a definitive ending. You know, it's not they all lived happily ever after or the opposite of that. But and, if you're morbid like me, then you assume that it's been a horrible, bloody massacre that happened. But then I, I suppose there are people that aren't morbid like me and they think, you know, maybe she didn't. But I can't, let's talk just for a second about that. You know, how do you n- decide where to end the story and if you end it nebulously like this then there's always the potential that 10 years later or whatever you can revisit this and have a sequel Uh uh-huh you know there's so many times we see movies and they they are hoping they end with a top spinning and spinning and then they cut before it ever topples or doesn't See, that was just a giant, giant F you. <laughs> there was never any intention of having an Inception 2. That's just, what, what would be the meanest thing we could do? Um, <laughs> but, you know, we'll see movies where, you know, they the first one comes out and they're just hoping that it does well enough. You know, they've already signed these people to three or four movies. And then every once in a while, there's a movie where it's a self-contained story and it ends and, and then, then it, it does successful. well, yeah. yeah. And, suddenly and they're, they're just like, like oh, gosh, what are we going to do? We've got to make a Matrix 2. Yeah, and you see that from time to time. And there are millions of dollars at, at stake. And so, you know, I can understand. I, I can't fault people most of the time for wanting to do a follow-up. Yeah, we've got to make an Avatar 2. <laughs> and 3 and 4. Although, boy... Those just keep getting pushed farther and farther and farther. I don't know if any of us will still be alive when those sequels come out, or if anyone who remembers the original Avatar right. will, be, will be of movie-going age will give a crap. It's already too late as far as that goes. But then, you know, then you get an ending like The Force Awakens, which, you know, I've mentioned many times I like that movie, but I don't like the ending. And it's like, oh, okay, so you guys didn't know how to end it. Is that, is that what happened? <laughs> they probably should have just ended it when they came back without the, okay, now let's just follow the map and we can, it's really easy to get there. I mean, they could have done a whole End movie. End it like Empire and, and she's leaving to go find Luke Skywalker. Right. They could have done, I mean, that's what I thought they were going to do, but they just kept going. You know, oh, she, she got there already? Okay. It's like Battlestar Galactica. I mean, there should have been a whole movie where they find the Earth. place and then... Well, and maybe that wasn't the best example. Um, but we all know examples of movies where, I mean, how blatant do you make it that this is to be continued, that this is that there are more story to be told? And sometimes they're foolish, like in the Golden Compasses case, and they don't end the narrative. They were just so confident that they would be able to make more that it, yeah, just like ends on a cliffhanger or, you know, they, they don't tie up the loose ends and that bothers me in book series as i've yeah, mentioned a as million times screamed at but me over and over it's more understandable in a book series cuz you've already maybe got a contract with penguin or something like that to do four books or you've already started or finished the second book by the time the first book comes out you know that kind of thing right and yeah this may sound dismissive of the publishing industry but there aren't Tens of millions of dollars writing on how well this book comes out. And, That's you know true. what I mean? There's tens of hundreds of dollars writing on it. Maybe. Yeah, I don't know. I had a story that I got to the end and I, I had the idea of the ending, but for some reason I just couldn't make it work. And it was just all kind of who has come to the realization of whether this is real or not real and are they scared about the future and if they're scared about the future is the story over or have have I made it suck I I still don't know if I ever got the ending right with it I I think I rewrote it three times to try and make it work changing who knew and that kind of stuff and in the end I'm just like this is the one I'm going with I guess I I'm not doing it a fourth time but I still don't feel awesome about it there's a uh, trouble with writing what do you remember about the writing of this uh story do you remember much i mean it's been years did you have challenges that you had to deal with or anything like that well 
we talked last time about the fact that it's got a 10 year old girl as its protagonist. She might be 11, but I think she's 10. And does that make it a children's story? <laughs> and in the back of my mind, it's like, well, how kid friendly do I make this? Or how adult do I make it? How? Because, okay, she, she's looking out the window and her neighbor is seducing a guy. Maybe he's a homeless guy. Maybe he's a salesman. Maybe he's Mr. Forco. How explicit do you make it? What of what is going on? Of what kind of you know? And how violent? How disturbing? How scary should it be? The answer to that is you know you've got to decide as a writer, and maybe you're wrong. Maybe somebody, in the same way that I, there's got to be somebody out there that just absolutely loves that Luke Skywalker looks at Ray, and then the credits roll. I mean, you know, they don't say anything. She holds out her hand to give him the lightsaber and just continues to hold it forever. And, but there, there's got to be people. Like you there realize I like, can't reach that far. I'm, I'm way the heck over here. <laughs> but he has the force. He could just have taken it. You could just throw it to me with the force, too. You know, you know why are you just standing there holding it? Please. There's no set answer of how explicit to make it or how, whatever you call it. And because I'm just publishing it myself, we're running it on the Dunstief. I don't have to answer to anybody who's just like, you know, I'd say this, you know, it's treading PG-13. Can we change this and this and this? And how evil do you make the witch? How evil is old lady Holcomb before you're just like, dude, I don't like this story anymore. Or, you know, before you start to worry for run, run, Laura, run. Because she goes over there. This is a, a part that I remember to learn some kind of spell. The witch is teaching her some kind of spell. But under the auspice of I'm helping her with a recipe to make cookies or brownies or something like uh-huh. that. And so the witch teaches her the magic. And then she's like, oh, oh, when you go home, take this. And, you know, she's like produced cookies. And I don't remember if she just made them with magic. They hadn't been cooking until that moment, and here they are, all warm and, and done. I mean, if, if I didn't write it that way, I'd like to go back in there and make it that. So Laura's just like, you know, I didn't smell cookies until right this second. But then Laura takes them home, and she's like, do I let my family eat these? What if? Because the only reason the witch is helping her is because she has that pendant that makes people believe you, that makes people, right? Makes you do what people tell and, you to and so, yeah, again, I didn't know how evil, how much danger is the, spo- the little girl supposed to be? And, and I don't know. You know, I'm not a parent. Maybe if I had a 10-year-old girl, I would be, I would write it differently. I would be much more protective of the little girl and want be to much reassure. much more vicious. Well, if I were you, yeah. <laughs> it's like, well, I, hey, I don't know if you heard, but we've got a newborn baby uh, in the house. And I was thinking about writing a story where a newborn baby dies. She's like, what? Who who is this? <laughs> it's like, oh, sorry, wrong number. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe I should have made it darker. Maybe I should have made Holcomb more obviously evil. Well, you know, I, I mean, she starts off by murdering a guy and stealing his life force or whatever to be young again. I don't know that you need to go any further from there on. She's always menacing and a threat right off the top. OK, she's murdered somebody. She's bad and scary. It's, I think it's much more of a chore that you had to make her appear eventually to be like, hey, you know, they should be friends. I like their little relationship that they have together. She's learning magic and it's cute and fun. And oh, it's much harder to get anywhere like that with somebody who starts off murdering somebody. So I think you're fine. As well, far as that goes. And yeah, from then on, after she's murdered, so you, you've got to be wary you know what's gonna happen are these cookies safe can i go into her house can i go out into the woods and find magic mushrooms with her that give you one up you go into the woods with a woman that you know is a murderer and i don't know maybe i should have played up the fear that lara has of that too but these are things that you can't know i mean it's like the story was supposed to be small and written you know, in two or three weeks so that that girl could voice Lara for us. Mm-hmm. And it ended up taking eight to 15 months or whatever to write the story because once the girl was out of the picture, I had no more motivation to finish it. And the story ended up much, much longer than I 
ever would have intended. I mean, so long that we split it over two episodes. And this is still like the shorter version. And I was sort of forced to do the shorter version because I sent you like the longer version for your parts. And then I got Bria's lines and I realized that she had done the voice of the witch as well. And I was like, oh, shoot. Well, I'm not going to make Bria redo these other scenes or whatever. And so I just told you, hey, forget about what I sent you. And just, yeah, just do the, the original version, which you I think by that point you had already done. I You were going to do the voice of the witch. Yes, absolutely. And I, I did do the, well, I mean, I did it all as a, a straight read, as they say. Well, I mean, if I'm the narrator, how straight it's can it be? a flamboyant read, you mean. Ah, <sighs> dear deliciousness. <laughs> yeah, so I had recorded the whole thing. And that version, I think, is out there on, on Audible. And then I was, yeah, just going to splice in her voice for uh, Lara. And then, yeah, your voice for some of the male characters. But she not only did Lara, but she did Holcomb. And she did, I think the sister has lines in this version. Yeah, she has And some. there's like the girl at school that the spell is cast to fall in love with the boy. And you had like one line for the boy. But I, I don't know how I got onto this. I, what I was saying is the story got out of hand and it just got longer and longer. And at this point, maybe expanded even further and it becomes a novel. Why the hell not? Again, there's no rule book that says it should have been this long. You should have stopped at this point. You should No, you can, should continue to write it from this point. It's just, you know, whatever you feel like. It's like, oh, gosh, I feel like it's, it's outlived its... Not its usefulness, but it's it's outstayed its welcome. It's like, okay, it should have ended by now. Like fish and unexpected visitors. I think it's the Ben Franklin saying that after two days or something like that, fish and house guests begin to stink. Or... But let's talk briefly about your book, Sunny and Gray. Uh, it is something that you wanted to write for a, for a very long time, or you started writing it a long, long, I did, long time yeah, ago. did, several years ago. And now you've been working on it in earnest, I mean, like, you've never worked on anything before, and it's just gigantic. <laughs> I mean, is it okay for me to use that word? Is that sure. A and so we've been talking a little bit about it of, like, well, why couldn't it be two books? And I think only you can answer that question because you don't have a publisher that you need to answer. I mean, a publisher could say, hey, dude, two 400-page books is great. One 700 page book is not so great, or what you know what I mean, right? You have to make that decision right now. You're at the midpoint, let's say, pretty and much. I, and yeah. how seriously have you been toying with the idea of just where it is right now is where it ends, and then yeah, I mean, I have been thinking about that a lot because I, I mean to just keep plowing through until I get to the end of the story idea that I have. Unfortunately, yeah, I'm at like the halfway point of that. But all along, I meant to have a kind of, you know how like sometimes you'll have a book and inside that book, it says part one or even book one. And then somewhere further in book two um, and they'll split it up like that. I was originally planning on splitting it up like that anyway and having either two or three parts like that. But yeah, now I'm kind of thinking, oh, maybe, I mean, the, there's kind of a big finale here. There's a big finale, a kind of a little coda, and then another big finale that I'm just about to write that I could just say, okay, that's the end of book one, which it was going to be anyways. Then I can just say, yeah, okay, this is sunny. And then the next half is gray or <laughs> something. I don't know. Uh, it is it is tough because it's long. Yeah, I mean, it's over 70,000 words now. I mean, that's not horribly long. That's book length. It's longer than anything I've ever written. But it's half of the story is the problem. You know, yeah, it's book length. But by the time it's done, it's going to be Brandon Sanderson book length. And nobody and wants nobody that. nobody wants that. Nobody at all. <laughs> <laughs> so well, like I'm narrating Jager Thunder for Abigail Hilton and I got to the end of book one today and yeah there's definitely a climax there's a big battle and then you know it's like here's who survived and you could write the end after that when book two begins like months have passed there's some kind of space between the two sections. Right. It would be fine on its own, just the book one as a book. And who decides? 
whether that is released on its own or whether, you know, it, with, with her books, they are quite big. I mean, we're not quite Brendan Sanderson size, but uh, a young Brendan Sanderson size. Maybe. <laughs> and with yours, the advantage to stopping now is that, okay, now you can go back to the start you know, do your revisions or whatever, working toward this being the end of book one. I'm going to try and make this as satisfying as I can as a whole. And I can put this out there and people can start to read it and, and I can make fans and I can get feedback and I can maybe get some money for it <laughs> while I'm working on the second oh. book. Sorry, that wasn't supposed to be a joke, was it? And, and again, you should be probably telling me these things rather than me saying what I guess is going on with you. But the advantage of not stopping is you have momentum that you've built up right now. You're writing every single day. You're working on it. Why not just continue to push on until the end? And then once it's a whole and you look and it's 1,100 pages or whatever it's, it is, you can say, okay, what do I want to do? Do I want to split it? Does it work better as two books? Does it work better as one giant book? I mean, again, only you can answer that question, right? I guess only me gets to decide in the end. I'm sure everybody who reads it can be like, oh, he should have ended here. What a dumbass. Uh, or, oh, I can't believe he ended here. I, I, what, what happens after that? Which I guess is probably good in a way, because if they're like, oh, what happens after that? Then, yeah, buy the uh, second one. Yeah, it's always hard to say. You know, I, I always got the impression from a lot of Ab Abigail Hilton stuff that they were actually one book, and then she went through and divided them up into like five pieces because they were too big otherwise. Mm. Like Cowrie Catchers, I always more had the impression that this was a book that she segmented into a series. And maybe I'm totally wrong. I, I, I don't know. Uh, same with Prophet of Panamandora. I, I felt the same way that this was a single tale that she segmented into a series. But, you know, and so... Uh, when it's that way, you can do several things with it, I suppose. You could make it, you know, separate pieces that you can buy. Or you could buy the whole thing. Buy the series. Or buy the series in one book kind of a thing, you know. And it in be... one huge volume. Right. And so, I guess in the end, those are still considered separate books, but... You know, you can get them however you want. You can, that's the, the magic, I suppose, of self publishing and print on demand and, and all that kind of stuff is if you're making an ebook with this thing. What is it going to hurt you to copy and paste the rest of the text in there? <laughs> you know, make two versions and people can pick which one they want. Because why not? I'm living a why not life. <laughs> you know, but, and well, that's something you told me to do. With Birth of a Sidekick. Because, yeah, I spent a long time writing a sequel. And then, you know, I was already kicking around ideas before the sequel even came out for what the third one would be. And you said, well, dude, when you finish the third one or however many there are, you need to publish these all as one volume and just call it Life of a Sidekick. And I was just like, wow, yeah, I guess I could. And then it would just be this giant tome. And you're like, yeah, you can charge more for that. <laughs> it's like, it's not any more work for you, but you can charge more for it. Yeah, and people and will I, pick whichever they want. You know, so a lot of people, like, and that's one of the, especially with Audible, you know, you have, you get a credit a month that you can spend, you know, depending on the book, you know, people are going to look at it and be like, oh, this is, a, this is two hours. I'm not going to spend my whole, I can get a Brandon Sanderson book. <laughs> That's 40 hours. Or this one that's two for the same price? Uh, probably wiser. I mean, it'll take me more than the month to listen to the 40-hour book. And so I'll already have another credit by the time I'm done. And so people are less likely to use it on something small. you know. But what if you're like me and you only have stuff that's small? Collect them into something that's big. Then people be like, oh, this is full size. It's eight, ten hours. It's worth it. Mm. Instead of, oh, it's just, it's one short story that's 45 minutes. No, I'm not. This better be damn cheap because I'm not going to use my credit on it. I'm going to have to buy it separately. I've had people tell me that before. Um, but what am I going to do? Not publish the short stories? No, I'll do them both. Um, do them all is what yeah. I'm saying. 
like I just said with the other one, you know, I, I could sell it as two separate books, sell it as one big book. I don't know, sell it by chapter. <laughs> I don't know what you can do with it, but, you know, however you can do it, do it. Because why not? Yeah, why not? Live a why not life. Surround yourself with... There's a million people that'll say, why? You need to find the one person that's going to say, why not? That's right. We've got five years. <laughs> that's all we've got. A goal is a dream with a deadline. That's right. That's why I gave you five years. Okay. So... We got five years. <laughs> Nobody even knows what we're talking this about. This episode here. brought to you by the Ankle Cast. <laughs> Nobody's listened to the Ankle Cast. Entertaining so three listeners <laughs> since 2011. <laughs> anyway. Anyway, I feel like that we've come to the end of this episode, or maybe it's gone on too long, but I. <laughs> it's probably more like it. It's what like are we gonna... my book. Still going when it should have ended 15,000 words ago. But see, that was the thing is. Do we release a three-hour version of this episode? Or do we split it into two, you know, 70-minute episodes or whatever? And, yeah, we chose to split it. I don't know if it was the right decision or not, but I, I think we felt like we could talk more when it was two episodes than if it had just been one super, super long episode. I don't know. I mean, people don't pay for the Noon Steve, right? They don't. True. So, so it didn't cost them any more if it's split over two, does it? Maybe we can change that so we can make more off of it. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> well, that's a discussion for another day. The whole Patreon thing and, you know, because sometimes I release stuff and I'll be like, oh, gosh, I don't feel like I, I should charge people for this episode because it's shorter than most of them are. And you get into that kind of thinking. Nobody else is going to think that. It's like the whole reason I'm putting out this episode is so that I can make money. <laughs> <sighs> Anyway, the whole reason they're paying it is so you will put out episodes. You see, I need to think that way. That's good stuff. Well, there we go. We've got another one and a half, let's call it, <laughs> episodes of the Dune Steve available. Yes. I hope people liked my story, and uh, Bria did a good job. She definitely had a different voice for the witch and different voice for Lara, and she did an accent for the witch. But we will never know how it would have felt different. To actually have like an 11 year old girl as yeah. Lara. More work, I would imagine. I, mean, I don't know, but you would have had an interesting experience of being in the booth with her and her mom standing there going, um, so the neighbor's having sex? Uh, I don't know. You know, that kind of thing. Who knows? That, see, that would have been an interesting. I saw the trailer for the movie she was in. Her mom would not have worried. Ah, okay, <laughs> excellent. Have you ever seen that, uh, was it Role Models, where there's that kid in there and he swears up a freaking blue streak all the time? Role Models was a good movie. I think I may have seen that movie and then talked to this girl's mom shortly after thinking, man, what kind of a parent lets their kid do that? She's like, well, now you know, it's me. <laughs> <laughs> so... That's it. Unless there's any business. I don't think there's any business. Is there? A... I don't think so. Yeah, just donate to the show. Donate to the Patreon of Rich Outfield. I still haven't got mine up yet, so someday that'll come, but it'll probably come after the announcement airs. And Yeah, well, the announcement has long since aired. Right, so I'm just point. saying. Once it has run its course, uh, that's probably when you might see a Patreon for me. I'm a little busy right now, unfortunately. Busy being a writer. Yeah, being a writer. Because and... a writer... Is someone who writes every day. Someone who writes every day. And I did that for 60, like, two days. In a row. Before I missed one, and now I'm, I haven't missed again since then. Wow, see, that's really so, impressive. You and I, before we recorded this episode, we went and we wrote. That's right. For an hour? Yeah, it was around an hour. It was like 45 minutes when I checked, and I had hit 1,012 words. And I went, oh, that's good enough. That's something that you said a month ago or whenever it was that we first started this is, oh, why didn't we start doing this years ago? I mean, here we are at the end of all things, Frodo. And now we come up with this idea of, of writing <laughs> right. and then hanging out. But you know, that doesn't mean that it's all over. All right. Well, thanks for listening, everybody. And uh, tell your friends about the Dune, Steve. If you like the Dune, Steve, you know, suggest that maybe a friend might like it if they might. I suppose you probably would anyways if you liked it, but the more folks hear it, the better for us anyways. And they get a whole bunch of free content, which is cool for them too, so. Be a good neighbor. There you go. Like State Farm. 
It's there. They're, they're there. <laughs> Good night. Okay, see you, folks. The Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine is published under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. This means that you can share the Dune Steve with anyone you'd like, but you can't sell or change the files. Take two. I'm going to go to bed, by the way. He's not going to. You can't make him. He's bigger than you. Yeah, but I could still beat him up. I can still lick him. Ew. I can. Your son!